yeah, see, the thing is, Stu, <laughs> whenever anybody starts with, we need to be realistic, or we need to be pragmatic, it's kind of like people beginning sentences with, um, at the end of the day, you know nothing good is gonna come at the end of that sentence, <laughs> right? You know it's always used to deliver. I'm, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be too harsh, but when you were talking about how hard life is for a developer to test all these different situations, all the different devices, all the different, it's not about you though, is it? No, it's about, it's, the, it's, it's about the, the amount of money it costs going into it. It's about hopefully creating uh, better tested and more reliable experiences better designed as well, because the more we're focusing on, on fewer experiences, ultimately, it's kind of what I was leading to at the end there, it's part of it at least, um, I think generally have a better chance of getting it right. And that's obviously a, a, a great win for users as well. Yeah, but to be realistic and to be pragmatic and at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> isn't that why it's called work, right? Sometimes stuff is hard and we get our heads down because you know it's the right thing to do. Right, I mean, I. Day to day, I, I, I deal with some, some very interesting problems. And I personally would rather be working on great experiences, making them hugely accessible, doing testing on different devices and all that sort of stuff. And if I can free up more of my time, more of my budget, more of my client's time, more of their budget, then I think that that's worth considering. So uh, to go to the feature detection, making it atomic or, or not grouping things together, potentially. Um, we're, we're talking about cutting the mustard here, right? That, that, yeah, so uh, cut, cut the mustard is a really good example of, of that kind of grouping, grouping a, a set of capabilities together and kind of using that as a benchmark. Um, I guess I'm saying, why stop there? You know, I, I think it's, it's reasonable to consider that you might have various sets of different tiers where you're, you've sort of gr grouped some capabilities together. I guess, but those, those specific mustard cutting tests, they need to be kind of individual to the project, right? You should probably shouldn't take somebody else's mustard cutting code and just drop it into your project. I, I think it needs to be completely down to the capabilities that those features are depending on. Yeah. Don't use a feature detect that detects something that you're not using. Yeah. Don't, and, and also don't use a feature that you haven't detected. Or don't try and use, sorry, don't try and use a capability that you have that you haven't detected. It should be that perfect matching, because that's how we, you know, I, by reducing the number of different experiences that, and different tiers that you're providing, um, you know, I'm not suggesting we do that to cut people out, but effectively make it more pragmatic. I still think that you know, there's obviously there's the whole um, the, the accessible tiers. Let's say are are incredibly important. The core. So that, that core functionality you want to make sure is... Yeah, is and, and, and even, you know, you might have a tier which adds a huge amount of extra benefit for people who aren't using conven conventional devices. Yeah. Um, well, on, on, on that, I mean, Forbes, you mentioned the fact that there are user agents out there that they can run JavaScript, but, you know, run JavaScript. So when it comes to, you sent something down from the server side, and now you can take over on the client side, do you have a mustard cutting test for deciding whether a browser is actually better off just continuing with server side all the way? I, I mean, I don't, I don't have a great answer to that, to be honest. I, I think, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of cases where you might say this code relies on this specific browser feature. If you've got any of that kind of thing, then, then use those and, and obviously don't, don't even load the JavaScript if you know that it's going to error out yeah. as soon as someone interacts with the page. Um, but in terms of, unfortunately, I think, I think browser APIs are really lacking at the moment in, in allowing you to detect how much memory the device you're on has or how much CPU power is available to you. I mean, you could try running a benchmark, but that seems mm. pretty wasteful of people's uh, battery and, uh, and so yeah. on on a, on a mobile device. Some things just are hard to test, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, uh, it might be a, one of those rare cases where user agent sniffing is worth considering. <laughs> yeah. but, Perhaps <laughs> as a, a blacklist rather than a whitelist, though, I'd say. Oh, OK, so you yes, could, if, you, if you have particular devices that you know a lot of users use, and you know that your app runs slowly on there with JavaScript enabled, maybe just put that on a list and say, this one okay. we won't send. Okay. That, that's exactly what we did on the Guardian. So um, if anyone uses the Guardian on an iPad, uh, you may be aware that the site crashes. Um, <laughs> and that's not terribly good for us, but um, it's a memory crash, so what we did is we just said, 
don't run any of the enhancing JavaScript if it's an iPad. By, by user agents sniffing? Um, yes, I believe so. OK. Yeah, you that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned that one of the great things about uh, using a service worker is it has to be a progressive enhancement. There's literally no other way of using it, right? Because first of all, someone has to visit your site. Yep. So you can't rely on the, on the service worker before they've installed the service worker. Do you also think that's a pretty clever adoption strategy for people who want to see service worker adopted? It's like, well, you might as well use it now, even though it only works in one or two browsers, because, hey, what do you got to lose? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I'm not Good. sure I have any, anything to add there, but yeah, I w <laughs> hopefully my talk demonstrated that it's really, really easy to add um, offline experiences as an enhancement, and it is an enhancement, so it doesn't cost you anything um, apart from having the technical that in the code base. And I think that's what you were just saying there, Stu, that you know, quite often thinking about progressive enhancement, always thinking about making sure that uh, you know, the core functionality is available to anyone, but providing the best functionality to the best browsers is the other side of it, right? And making sure that we're not crippling uh, good browsers and giving them the, the lowest tier possible just because a, a technology isn't available everywhere. Right? Yeah, and I think that's actually a completely kind of valid risk of what I was proposing is that if, you're, if you are grouping some sets of functionality together and kind of creating a tier for that, then there is actually a decent chance. So the example I gave about, you know, sort of if your top tier was expected WebGL and voice input, then at the mm. moment you'd be excluding Edge from that even though it has WebGL support. Now, in kind of purest progressive enhancement terms and trying to give every, as many users as possible the best possible experience, that's not ideal. I completely appreciate that. But these are trade-offs. At the end of the day, being realistic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. um, if you don't mind me asking, Ollie, you mentioned issues with moving to HTTPS. Uh, yeah, I should have elaborated on that. So no, no, it's OK. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, it's primarily ads, ad networks. Well, I don't. Yeah, okay. Um, support HTTPS or they're not ready to support HTTPS. Um, Figured as much. But we are, this is why we're doing like testing. Um, I think we've, uh, the reason we migrated the science front to HTTPS is so that we could do a test and see how many ads fail to load. Um, I don't have the results of that yet, but um, that's the primary concern. It's almost as if the fundamental user benefits of HTTPS are opposed to the whole business model of advertising. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, Forbes, you've demonstrated that it's entirely possible and doable to do server-side rendering and client-side rendering. It's not an either or, you can absolutely do both. But is there an, uh, an element here of mindset, how you approach it? Is it important that you think of one first and then the other? In other words, that it's server-side rendered first and then you enhance to client-side, or is it that you think about the client-side rendering and that you, you're thinking about server-side as the, the fallback or the backup. Is there a big difference? Yeah, I mean, I, so when I, I my, my background originally is in server-side code, writing server-side Node.js applications. I, I've migrated relatively recently to, to working on more front-end things. So when I first looked at this, first approached the problem, my natural instinct was to say, hey, let's write a server application and let's run it on the client somehow. Let's if we've, if we've written it in JavaScript anyway, why can't I make my Node app run on the client? The problem you find with that is that it's really hard to build the right interaction models in. So it's, it's, it's hard to get the, the more advanced, more fluid interfaces and, and build those when you're talking in the language of requests and responses. Mm. Um, so I think from that point of view, that doesn't really work. Um, Whereas the other, thing, the other extreme, I think, works OK. If you mostly think in terms of clients, then providing you uh, adhere to, to sensible, the, 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 the way that the, the, the web works. We had that talk earlier about, about mm -hmm. REST and, and how the, the, the web works and how browsers work. Um, if you adhere to those principles, so you use the URL for navigation, you use uh, semantic elements like forms to represent uh, input, then for the most part, you can make a, an app that was built as a primarily client-side app work as a server-side app. I think that, that works OK. Yeah, I think what's great about the approach you're suggesting is that you're not doing what Stefan was warning against, which is reinventing a browser. It's more like you're augmenting a browser. Mm -hmm. like you're making use of what a browser can already do and then augment on top of it. Um, Stu, just in terms of this kind of bundling of, of features together, let's say the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript for a particular thing, um, thinking about it, you know, historically with progressive enhancement, we've talked about 
things in these tiers, like you got their structure, and that's HTML, and CSS is for mm -hmm. presentation, and JavaScript, that's for enhancement. Is that dangerous? Because it's a bit reductive, isn't it? And like you say, actually things are, are bundles of all three. Yeah, and I, I think, well, the, so the, um, yeah, that, that kind of classic three layers model, the, the instant objection I have to that is the fact that JavaScript can sit right on top of HTML, and mm. for users who have poor sight, that's a still very, very valuable pairing, you know? Mm. And I, I know that it, it was never designed to be taken that literally, but I think people do take it that literally. I, um, I think that sometimes people use that as the defense why they don't use progressive enhancements. Mm. Well, my app uses lots of JavaScript. JavaScript you know, is only supposed to be used for enhancement, therefore I'm gonna forget progressive enhancement. It's actually dangerous. Yeah, indeed. Um, so looking at the way you're bundling things together, are you a fan of web components? Um, I haven't personally delved into them as, as much as I'd like to. I, you know, I, I, I like the concept, but there are certain parts of the, 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 the APIs and the way that they're, that they're implemented that haven't quite gelled with me yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm kind of completely tied to any of these other frameworks. I think there's, there's, there's a lot of scope for finding almost a kind of like a, a simpler way of having these kind of these components. I think, you know, the, the model that Angular has is fantastic, but Angular as a whole is so heavy that right. if I just want a few kind of little components, then that's, that completely goes against what everything I've just been saying about right. trying to reduce page weight as a way to, you know, avoid all the kind of issues. Right. We, kind of want the, we kind of want the bits we want and not have to take the whole monolithic Right, stack. exactly. And yeah. I'm sure there are loads and loads of libraries out there that I should be looking at. Um, yeah, and w when web components are ubiquitous, then maybe that will be when, when that kind of really, really yeah. kicks off. Um, I could ask so many more questions, but I feel like I'm being unfair and <laughs> hardly got any time. So can I get a quick show of hands of anybody who has a question? We've got at least one. Can any others? Okay, I think we might be able to fit in one or two. Uh, let's get you here. Just if you could wait for the mic. Um, I wanted to ask Oli about the offline page on The Guardian. You, how much um, extra bandwidth does it take up to download the crossword every day? And is that a, was that a concern for you at all? Do you, how, do, how do you balance what you, what you download to make available offline with uh, bandwidth yep. considerations? That's a good question. Um, so currently, we just download the, the crossword every day regardless of your internet connection. Um, and I think that would be a concern going forward. Um, have you heard of the Net Info API? I think this would provide something that we could al allow us to say only download it if the user has a good connection. Um, so that, yeah. that API is problematic, right? It's basically, it returns like probably, maybe, and perhaps is the kind but of. It's, it's poor if what you're trying to do is detect the speed of the connection. Mm. But what it would allow you to do, I think, is say whether you're on a mobile connection, which is likely to be metered and very expensive, or a, a right. kind of Wi-Fi connection. OK, so you're kind of inferring That's some stuff from that. Yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you look to native, and I think native apps always serve as a good model for offline, because they've been doing it for years. And native apps, you have the choice whether you want your apps to update over 3G or Wi-Fi. So maybe in the future, There'll mm. be something that you can configure service workers in the browser to only allow functionality like updating to happen when you have a good connection. Because um, it raises a good point, but I mean, service workers could become a tragedy of the commons if we all just pile on and start saying, yeah, yeah cache all this stuff. Um, you know, uh, it's gonna be bad for, for users in aggregate. Sure, it's fine at the beginning, there's only a few people using service workers, but if, it feels like we need to be ethical and responsible in, in, yeah. in what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's get just one more question, and I'm afraid we're going to have to break because we're, we're already running over. Uh, who else had a question? There were two hands up. There you were. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we we'll, don't think we'll be able to get to yours. Mainly interested in what you spoke about, uh, Stu, on the, the tiering. Do you not think applying the same ideas that Atomic Design has brought to components of the web could be used in the same way to still have that control over the features that you provide, but opening up a lot more features to a lot more users? Um, yes, potentially. I mean, I, I guess it depends kind of exactly how you'd want to apply that, that sort of mentality and that, that, that sort of approach. I think um, 
you, could you elaborate slightly more on how you picture, because atomic design is kind of, I've got a thing. There, there is actually like working. We're plugging different parts together, these yeah. sorts of approaches. There's, there's so an example that the, the Philemon group have done where they take just, you know, finding a, an address. And mm -hmm. to begin with, it's, you know, a piece of text, and then there's an image of the location, and then there's a slippy map, and, and right. animations, right? So, but you've got it sandboxed into just the functionality of finding an address. Sure. So there's, that's the atomic approach? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it completely makes sense. And I think um, when, I, when I was sort of su suggesting, um, you know, having those different features within individual modules, that's sort of, uh, sorry, different enhancements within the actual module it belongs to, and structuring your code like that, kind of the idea I was getting at there. Um, whether or not I'd kind of consider it as pluggable as atomic design is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, there's always this, this issue that the more layers you create, the more effectively, the more gaps there are in the net that people could fall through and people could end up with a broken experience because it's that case you didn't test or it's you know, that, that case that hadn't, didn't quite fit with the, the capabilities that were available. Yeah. Okay, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut it short there because we're gonna take a lunch break. Lunch break will last one hour and 10 minutes and we're gonna kick off again a quarter to two. We'll try and be back here maybe around half past. Do you have something to yeah, say? Yeah, so just a couple of announcements. Um,